Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 469, A Touch of Slapstick. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I hope you are well. I am well. Things have been a little bit hectic. Thing one had all four wisdom teeth taken out. And of course, it's the beginning of the school year, which means it's all back to school this and go and order that and don't forget the yearbook. And oh, by the way, this year we have. And for those of you who are longtime listeners, I know that this is going to make you have a little moment. So you might want to sit down because this year we also had to have taken, select, and order senior portraits for thing one. Yes, that's how long this podcast has gone on. When I first started, Thing One was in kindergarten. So for those of you those of you who have been with me this whole time, wow, we really need to sit down and have a drink together and go over what, what has just occurred in the span of the last several years. Uh, and for those of you who have run the gauntlet of showing up and listening to all 11 and a half years of episodes, it's been compressed in time for you. But nonetheless, congratulations, we've made it to his senior year. I'm still kind of shell-shocked. But I went to back to school night last night and met all of his teachers, and his classes are wonderful, and his teachers are great, and I'm very excited for his year. I want to go take some of his classes, too. So that's been a lot of fun and very freaky all at the same time, which I suppose actually is kind of like life. And... The Count. This week, there really isn't a whole lot for me to share with you beyond just a couple of things, one of which is that the second chapter that we listened to today is full of slapstick. So you're welcome. (laughs) Dumas clearly felt that everybody needed a little bit of fun in the middle of the crushing pain that is the end of the book. Crushing and yet arguably justifiable pain. So there's that. There are a couple of other references that I wanted to go over with you today. But before we get to today's chapters, which are eight, uh, sorry, eight, 108, 109, 110, and 111, because these are all related chapters, I got so many voicemails and messages and emails all about the Black Mariah and the Salad Basket. And I knew you would come through. You are just so awesome. We heard from Jennifer and Christine and Olwen and Sarah, just to name a few. There are more. We're going to play a couple for you as well. But we got links, actually several different links from different places. Christine sent some really, really interesting ones. But I'm going to smash all of the comments together into this. The salad basket in the French version of the police van or carriage. Jennifer mentioned that she wondered, there's a traditional French wire salad drying basket to dry your lettuce before you plop it into salad form. She's wondering if that's where the salad basket phrase comes from because it is wire cage-like basketry and the way that they describe the, the metal grating on this particular police wagon might, in fact, have looked like that. So that's one. I didn't know that there was a traditional French wire salad drying basket. So there's that. For the Black Mariah, Olwen mentions growing up in England and used Black Mariah to refer to the black police vans that were used for transporting prisoners. The translation, and this is a comment that many, many people made, The assumption is that the translation in the Victorian version versus the modern version 
was one of completely one of colloquial statements. So salad basket would have been the early Victorian French version in French salad basket in the Victorian English version would have been a literal word for word translation. Robin Buss being British would have used the British colloquialism, which was Black Mariah, Black Police Van. And then leaving those idiomatic phrases behind, the one that people kept connecting the phraseology to in the United States was paddy wagon, P-A-D-D-Y-W-A-G-O-N, something that actually came up in a speech not too long ago that was made by the president here. This gets interesting because Christine, who you might know as Crumbs from His Table, she found a whole bunch of articles, and all of these are going to be in the show notes, on the usage of the term paddy wagon. Some people were unhappy with the president's use of this term because they said it was an, an ethnic slur. Paddy going back to Ireland, another name for, I guess, a diminutive form of Patrick. Paddy wagon, Irish certainly in Boston, but also in New York, in the, the northern Atlantic region. As immigration did what immigration does, you get these big waves of immigration from places. The Irish come over, the Irish move in, the Irish eventually move up out of the Lower East Side, which is where all poorer immigrant groups went to early on. They move up and out of the Lower East Side and into larger society. One of the ways that this happened is you had a lot of Irish immigrants going into law enforcement and fire protection. So you had a lot of Irish policemen and you had a lot of Irish firemen, among other ethnic groups. I'm just focusing on the Irish for now. Now, this is where it gets interesting because some people think that the paddy wagon is an offensive term because the Irish would get drunk and get picked up and put into the paddy wagon and taken to prison to either sober up or if they caused real trouble to get arrested and arraigned and all of that. Some people think it's called a paddy wagon because the Irish were using it. The Irish police officers were using it. I don't have access to the OED right now, so I don't have any more access to more specific information than this. But it is an interesting problem, right? Because right now people get upset about words. Words carry meaning. Meaning can mean good things or bad things. And here we have a term that is actually, without something like the OED, really kind of hard to parse. And there doesn't seem to be any consistent or very specifically sourced consensus about this term. So either paddy wagon is a term that was used by Irish cops to describe the Black Mariah or the salad basket that they used, or it was a term that was used as a slur against Irish who were being picked up by the police officers and taken to the prison. I don't know, but it's an interesting problem. And it all goes back to the salad basket and the Black Mariah. So thank you everyone for calling in and writing in with answers and links and all of this cool stuff. And thank you for reminding us that words, you know, actually matter. I love that. All right. So that takes care of last week. This week we have, we have new stuff. We have a reference to a character lopping off the top of the poppies, walking through a garden and with his walking stick, knocking off the tops of poppies. And it's clearly a reference to something. So I went and I looked this up and it's kind of cool. And the best part as I was reading around about this, is that it's actually referred to as the tall poppy syndrome on Wikipedia, which I loved. This has become a syndrome. This goes way, way, way back. So there was a ruler named Sextus Tarquinius. His son, Tarquin, became a ruler in another land, uh, Gabai. And he said, you know, hey, dad, I'm sending you this messenger with this message because I've done all the stuff I'm supposed to do. I'm in charge. Nobody bugs me. It's all good, but I'm kind of bored. So what do I do now? The messenger shows up to Sextus Tarquinus, gives him this message, and the father, instead of responding, goes out into the garden, takes a stick, and starts whacking off the top of all 
the tallest poppies in the garden. The messenger keeps waiting for a response, isn't getting one. Suddenly the light goes off and he goes, oh, I get it. He goes back to the sun and says, hey, Tarquin, here's what your dad says. Your dad wants you to kill off all of the most powerful people who are left. And that way you won't have any trouble anymore. There won't be anything else that could cause you trouble, anything else left that could cause you trouble. And so that's what he did. He just killed them all, knocking the heads off the tallest poppies. That's where that comes from. There are several different versions of the story, but that's, that's the one that I found most consistently. So that was kind of cool. There's also another reference of being irresistibly attracted to something like a bird to a serpent. And this was interesting because a bunch of us were looking for the original source of this and we haven't found it. I was sure it was a fable. And then I started thinking, oh, it sounds like a just so story. Maybe it's going back to some like one-off line from the Mahabharata or something, you know, something from Africa, some old, old, old story. I still haven't found it. But the idea is that birds, because they can fly, can get away. And snakes are fast. And so if you're kind of a cocky bird, (laughs) you are going to find it really hard not to, on occasion, tempt a snake or just you know, have fun seeing how close you can fly to the head of a snake without getting 86. So there's a story there, but that's the most I can do right now. Like I said, I found, you know, bits and pieces of references to older stories, but I didn't find anything conclusive. So if you know something, give us a call 206-350-1642 or email heather at craftlit.com and We'll share it next week. I already warned you that in uh, chapter 109, we're going to get some slapstick. Actually, there's quite a bit of slapstick, but there's a very specific slapsticky bit with a monocle, which is fun. And that's pretty much it. We get another reference to cambric, a lightweight linen or cotton fabric, uh, lightweight, closely woven, very fine. Oh, and livid. Livid if you if you turn livid, you are turning a darkish, bluish gray color. It's not livid red or splotchy. It's dark blue gray. So just keep that in mind. Not not a healthy looking color is what we're going for here. And that's it. All right, let's listen to 108, 109, 110, and 111 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 108. The Judge. We remember that the Abbe Boussigny remained alone with Noirtier in the chamber of death, and that the old man and the priest were the sole guardians of the young girl's body. Perhaps it was the Christian exhortations of the Abbe, perhaps his kind charity, perhaps his persuasive words which had restored the courage of Noirtier, for ever since he had conversed with the priest, His violent despair had yielded to a calm resignation, which surprised all who knew his excessive affection for Valentine. M. de Villefort had not seen his father since the morning of the death. The whole establishment had been changed. Another valet was engaged for himself, a new servant for Noirtier. Two women had entered Madame de Villefort's service. In fact, everywhere to the concierge and the coachman, New faces were presented to the different masters of the house, thus widening the division which had always existed between the members of the same family. The assizes also were about to begin, and Villefort, shut up in his room, exerted himself with feverish anxiety in drawing up the case against the murderer of Caderousse. This affair, like all those in which the Count of Monte Cristo had interfered, caused a great sensation in Paris. The proofs were certainly not convincing, since they rested upon a few words written by an escaped galley-slave on his deathbed, and who might have been actuated by hatred or revenge in accusing his companion. But the mind of the procureur was made up. He felt assured that Benedetto was guilty, and he hoped by his skill in conducting this aggravated case to flatter his self-love, 
which was about the only vulnerable point left in his frozen heart. The case was therefore prepared owing to the incessant labour of Villefort, who wished it to be the first on the list in the coming assizes. He had been obliged to seclude himself more than ever, to evade the enormous number of applications presented to him for the purpose of obtaining tickets of admission to the court on the day of trial, and then so short a time had elapsed since the death of poor Valentine, and the gloom which overshadowed the house was so recent that no one wondered to see the father so absorbed in his professional duties, which were the only means he had of dissipating his grief. Once only had Villefort seen his father. It was the day after that upon which Bertuccio had paid his second visit to Benedetto, when the latter was to learn his father's name. The magistrate, harassed and fatigued, had descended to the garden of his house, and in a gloomy mood, similar to that in which Tarquin lopped off the tallest poppies, he began knocking off with his cane the long and dying branches of the rose-trees, which, placed along the avenue, seemed like the spectres of the brilliant flowers which had bloomed in the past season. More than once he had reached that part of the garden where the famous boarded gate stood overlooking the deserted enclosure, always returning by the same path to begin his walk again, at the same pace and with the same gesture, when he accidentally turned his eyes towards the house, whence he heard the noisy play of his son, who had returned from school to spend the Sunday and Monday with his mother. While doing so, he observed Monsieur Noirtier at one of the open windows, where the old man had been placed that he might enjoy the last rays of the sun, which yet yielded some heat, and was now shining upon the dying flowers and red leaves of the creeper which twined around the balcony. The eye of the old man was riveted upon a spot which Villefort could scarcely distinguish. His glance was so full of hate, of ferocity, and savage impatience, that Villefort turned out of the path he had been pursuing to see upon what person this dark look was directed. Then he saw beneath a thick clump of linden trees, which were nearly divested of foliage, Madame de Villefort, sitting with a book in her hand, the perusal of which she frequently interrupted to smile upon her son, or to throw back his elastic ball, which he obstinately threw from the drawing-room into the garden. Villefort became pale. He understood the old man's meaning. Noirtier continued to look at the same object, but suddenly his glance was transferred from the wife to the husband, and Villefort himself had to submit to the searching investigation of eyes, which, while changing their direction, and even their language, had lost none of their menacing expression. Madame de Villefort, unconscious of the passions that exhausted their fire over her head, at that moment held her son's ball, and was making signs to him to reclaim it with a kiss. Edward begged for a long while, the maternal kiss probably not offering sufficient recompense for the trouble he must take to obtain it. However, at length he decided, leapt out of the window into a cluster of heliotropes and daisies, and ran to his mother, his forehead streaming with perspiration. Madame de Villefort wiped his forehead, pressed her lips upon it, and sent him back with the ball in one hand and some bonbon in the other. Villefort, drawn by an irresistible attraction like that of the bird to the serpent, walked towards the house. As he approached it, Noirtier's gaze followed him, and his eyes appeared of such a fiery brightness that Villefort felt them pierce to the depths of his heart. In that earnest look might be read a deep reproach, as well as a terrible menace. Then Noirtier raised his eyes to heaven, as though to remind his son of a forgotten oath. "'It is well, sir,' replied Villefort from below. "'It is well. Have patience.' but one day longer. What I have said, I will do. Noirtier seemed to be calmed by these words, and turned his eyes with indifference to the other side. Villefort violently unbuttoned his greatcoat, which seemed to strangle him, and passing his livid hand across his forehead, entered his study. The night was cold and still. 
the family had all retired but villefort who alone remained up and worked till five o'clock in the morning reviewing the last interrogatories made the night before by the examining magistrates compiling the depositions of the witnesses and putting the finishing stroke to the deed of accusation which was one of the most energetic and best conceived of any he had yet delivered the next day monday was the first sitting of the assizes the morning dawned dull and gloomy and villefort saw the dim gray light shine upon the lines he had traced in red ink the magistrate had slept for a short time while the lamp sent forth its final struggles its flickerings awoke him and he found his fingers as damp and purple as though they had been dipped in blood he opened the window a bright yellow streak crossed the sky and seemed to divide in half the poplars which stood out in black relief on the horizon in the clover fields beyond the chestnut trees a lark was mounting up to heaven while pouring out her clear morning song the damps of the dew bathed the head of villefort and refreshed his memory today he said with an effort today the man who holds the blade of justice must strike wherever there is guilt involuntarily his eyes wandered towards the window of noirtier's room where he had seen him the preceding night the curtain was drawn and yet the image of his father was so vivid to his mind that he addressed the closed window as though it had been open and as if through the opening he had beheld the menacing old man yes he murmured yes be satisfied his head dropped upon his chest and in this position he paced his study then he threw himself dressed as he was upon a sofa less to sleep than to rest his limbs cramped with cold and study by degrees everyone awoke villefort from his study heard the successive noises which accompany the life of a house the opening and shutting of doors the ringing of madame de villefort's bell to summon the waiting maid mingled with the first shouts of the child who rose full of the enjoyment of his age villefort also rang his new valet brought him the papers and with them a cup of chocolate what are you bringing me said he a cup of chocolate i did not ask for it who has paid me this attention my mistress sir she said you would have to speak a great deal in the murder case and that you should take something to keep up your strength and the valet placed the cup on the table nearest to the sofa which was like all the rest covered with papers the valet then left the room villefort looked for an instant with a gloomy expression then suddenly taking it up with a nervous motion he swallowed its contents at one draught it might have been thought that he hoped the beverage would be mortal and that he sought for death to deliver him from a duty which he would rather die than fulfill he then rose and paced his room with a smile it would have been terrible to witness the chocolate was inoffensive for monsieur de villefort felt no effects the breakfast hour arrived but monsieur de villefort was not at table the valet re-entered madame de villefort wishes to remind you sir he said that eleven o'clock has just struck and that the trial commences at twelve well said villefort what then madame de villefort is dressed she is quite ready and wishes to know if she is to accompany you sir where to to the palais what to do my mistress wishes much to be present at the trial ah said villefort with a startling accent does she wish that the man drew back and said if you wish to go alone sir i will go and tell my mistress villefort remained silent for a moment and dented his pale cheeks with his nails tell your mistress he at length answered that i wish to speak to her and i beg she will wait for me in her own room yes sir then come to dress and shave me directly sir the valet reappeared almost instantly and having shaved his master 
assisted him to dress entirely in black when he had finished he said my mistress said she should expect you sir as soon as you had finished dressing i am going to her and villefort with his papers under his arm and hat in hand directed his steps toward the apartment of his wife at the door he paused for a moment to wipe his damp pale brow he then entered the room madame de villefort was sitting on an ottoman and impatiently turning over the leaves of some newspapers and pamphlets which young edward by way of amusing himself was tearing to pieces before his mother could finish reading them she was dressed to go out her bonnet was placed beside her on a chair and her gloves were on her hands ah here you are monsieur she said in her naturally calm voice but how pale you are have you been working all night why did you not come down to breakfast well will you take me or shall i take edward madame de villefort had multiplied her questions in order to gain one answer but to all her inquiries monsieur de villefort remained mute and cold as a statue edward said villefort fixing an imperious glance on the child go and play in the drawing-room my dear i wish to speak to your mamma madame de villefort shuddered at the sight of that cold countenance that resolute tone and the awfully strange preliminaries edward raised his head looked at his mother and then finding that she did not confirm the order began cutting off the heads of his leaden soldiers edward cried monsieur de villefort so harshly that the child started up from the floor do you hear me go the child unaccustomed to such treatment arose pale and trembling it would be difficult to say whether his emotion were caused by fear or passion his father went up to him took him in his arms and kissed his forehead go he said go my child edward ran out monsieur de villefort went to the door which he closed behind the child and bolted dear me said the young woman endeavoring to read her husband's inmost thoughts while a smile passed over her countenance which froze the impassibility of villefort what is the matter madame where do you keep the poison you generally use said the magistrate without any introduction placing himself between his wife and the door madame de villefort must have experienced something of the sensation of a bird which looking up sees the murderous trap closing over its head a hoarse broken tone which was neither a cry nor a sigh escaped from her while she became deadly pale monsieur she said i i do not understand you and in her first paroxysm of terror she had raised herself from the sofa in the next stronger very likely than the other she fell down again on the cushions i asked you continued villefort in a perfectly calm tone where you conceal the poison by the aid of which you have killed my father-in-law monsieur de saint meron my mother-in-law madame de saint meron barrois and my daughter valentine ah sir exclaimed madame de villefort clasping her hands what do you say it is not for you to interrogate but to answer is it to the judge or to the husband stammered madame de villefort to the judge to the judge madame it was terrible to behold the frightful pallor of that woman the anguish of her look the trembling of her whole frame ah sir she muttered ah sir and this was all you do not answer madame exclaimed the terrible interrogator then he added with a smile yet more terrible than his anger it is true then you do not deny it she moved forward and you cannot deny it added villefort extending his hand towards her as though to seize her in the name of justice you have accomplished these different crimes with impudent address but which could only deceive those whose affections for you blinded them since the death of madame de saint meron i have known that a poisoner lived in my house monsieur d'avrigny warned me of it after the death of barrois 
my suspicions were directed towards an angel. Those suspicions which, even when there is no crime, are always alive in my heart. But after the death of Valentine, there has been no doubt in my mind, madame. And not only in mine, but in those of others. Thus your crime, known by two persons, suspected by many, will soon become public. And as I told you just now, you no longer speak to the husband, but to the judge. The young woman hid her face in her hands. Oh, sir, she stammered, I beseech you, do not believe appearances. Are you then a coward? cried Villefort in a contemptuous voice. But I have always observed that poisoners were cowards. Can you be a coward? You who have the courage to witness the death of two old men and a young girl murdered by you? Sir, sir, can you be a coward? continued Villefort with increasing excitement. You who could count one by one the minutes of four death agonies? You who have arranged your infernal plans and removed the beverages with a talent and precision almost miraculous? Have you, then, who have calculated everything with such nicety, have you forgotten to calculate one thing? I mean, where the revelation of your crimes will lead you to? Oh, it is impossible. You must have saved some surer, more subtle and deadly poison than any other, that you might escape the punishment that you deserve. You have done this, I hope so at least. Madame de Villefort stretched out her hands, and fell on her knees. "'I understand,' he said. "'You confess, but a confession made to the judges. "'A confession made at the last moment, "'extorted when the crime cannot be denied, "'diminishes not the punishment inflicted on the guilty.' "'The punishment?' exclaimed Madame de Villefort. "'The punishment, monsieur?' "'Twice you have pronounced that word.' "'Certainly. "'Did you hope to escape it because you were four times guilty? "'Did you think the punishment would be withheld "'because you are the wife of him who pronounced it? "'No, madame, no. "'The scaffold awaits the poisoner, whoever she may be, "'unless, as I just said, "'the poisoner has taken the precaution of keeping for herself a few drops of her deadliest potion. Madame de Villefort uttered a wild cry, and a hideous and uncontrollable terror spread over her distorted features. "'Oh, do not fear the scaffold, madame,' said the magistrate. "'I will not dishonour you, since that would be dishonour to myself. No, if you have heard me distinctly, you will understand that you are not to die on the scaffold.' "'No, I, I, I do not understand. What do you mean?' stammered the unhappy woman, completely overwhelmed. "'I mean that the wife of the first magistrate in the capital shall not, by her infamy, soil an unblemished name, that she shall not, with one blow, dishonour her husband and her child.' "'No, no, oh, no!' "'Well, madame, it will be a laudable action on your part, and I will thank you for it.' "'You will thank me for what?' "'For what you have just said.' "'What did I say? Oh, my brain whirls! I no longer understand anything! Oh, my God! My God!' And she rose with her hair dishevelled and her lips foaming. "'Have you answered the question I put to you on entering the room?' "'Where do you keep the poison you generally use, madame?' Madame de Villefort raised her arms to heaven and convulsively struck one hand against the other. "'No! No!' she vociferated. "'No! You cannot wish that!' "'What I do not wish, madame, is that you should perish on the scaffold. Do you understand?' asked Villefort. "'Oh, mercy! Mercy, monsieur!' "'What I require is 
that justice be done i am on the earth to punish madame he added with a flaming glance any other woman were the queen herself i would send to the executioner but to you i shall be merciful to you i will say have you not madame put aside some of the surest deadliest most speedy poison oh pardon me sir let me live she is cowardly said villefort reflect that i am your wife you are a poisoner in the name of heaven no in the name of the love you once bore me no no in the name of our child oh for the sake of our child let me live no no i tell you one day if i allow you to live you will perhaps kill him as you have the others i i kill my boy cried the distracted mother rushing toward villefort i kill my son <laughs> and a frightful demonic laugh finished the sentence which was lost in a hoarse rattle madame de villefort fell at her husband's feet he approached her think of it madame he said if on my return justice has not been satisfied i will denounce you with my own mouth and arrest you with my own hands she listened panting overwhelmed crushed her eye alone lived and glared horribly do you understand me he said i am going down there to pronounce the sentence of death against a murderer if i find you alive on my return you shall sleep tonight in the conciergerie madame de villefort sighed her nerves gave way and she sunk on the carpet the king's attorney seemed to experience a sensation of pity he looked upon her less severely and bowing to her said slowly farewell madame farewell that farewell struck madame de villefort like the executioner's knife she fainted the procureur went out after having double locked the door end of chapter 108 chapter 109 the assizes the benedetto affair as it was called at the palais and by people in general had produced a tremendous sensation frequenting the cafe de paris the boulevard de gand and the bois de boulogne during his brief career of splendor the false cavalcanti had formed a host of acquaintances the papers had related his various adventures both as a man of fashion and the galley slave and as every one who had been personally acquainted with prince andrea cavalcanti experienced a lively curiosity in his fate they all determined to spare no trouble in endeavouring to witness the trial of monsieur benedetto for the murder of his comrade in chains in the eyes of many benedetto appeared if not a victim to at least an instance of the fallibility of the law monsieur cavalcanti his father had been seen in paris and it was expected that he would reappear to claim the illustrious outcast many also who were not aware of the circumstances attending his withdrawal from paris were struck with the worthy appearance the gentlemanly bearing and the knowledge of the world displayed by the old patrician who certainly played the nobleman very well so long as he said nothing and made no arithmetical calculations as for the accused himself many remembered him as being so amiable so handsome and so liberal that they chose to think him the victim of some conspiracy since in this world large fortunes frequently excite the malevolence and jealousy of some unknown enemy every one therefore ran to the court some to witness the sight others to comment upon it from seven o'clock in the morning a crowd was stationed at the iron gates and an hour before the trial commenced the hall was full of the privileged before the entrance of the magistrates and indeed frequently afterwards a court of justice on days when some special trial is to take place resembles a drawing-room where many persons recognize each other and converse if they can do so without losing their seats 
or if they're separated by too great a number of lawyers communicate by signs it was one of the magnificent autumn days which made amends for a short summer the clouds which m de villefort had perceived at sunrise had all disappeared as if by magic and one of the softest and most brilliant days of september shone forth in all its splendour beauchamp one of the kings of the press and therefore claiming the right of a throne everywhere was eyeing everybody through his monocle he perceived chateau renaud and de bray who had just gained the good graces of a sergeant-at-arms and who had persuaded the latter to let them stand before instead of behind him as they ought to have done the worthy sergeant had recognized the minister's secretary and the millionaire and by the way of paying extra attention to his noble neighbors promised to keep their places while they paid a visit to beauchamp well said beauchamp we shall see our friend yes indeed replied debray that worthy prince deuce take those italian princes a man too who could boast of dante for a genealogist and could reckon back to the divine comedy a nobility of the rope said chateau renaud phlegmatically he will be condemned will he not asked de bray of beauchamp my dear fellow i think we should ask you that question you know such news much better than we do did you see the president at the minister's last night yes what did he say something which will surprise you oh make haste and tell me then it is a long time since that has happened well he told me that benedetto who is considered a serpent of subtlety and a giant of cunning is really but a very commonplace silly rascal and altogether unworthy of the experiments that will be made on his phrenological organs after his death bah said beauchamp he played the prince very well yes for you who detest those unhappy princes beauchamp and are always delighted to find fault with them but not for me who discover a gentleman by instinct and who sent out an aristocratic family like a very bloodhound of heraldry then you have never believed in the principality yes in the principality but not in the prince not so bad said beauchamp still i assure you he passed very well with many people i saw him at the minister's house ah oh, yes said chateau renaud the idea of thinking ministers understand anything about princes <laughs> there is something in what you have just said said beauchamp laughing but said de bray to beauchamp if i spoke to the president you must have been with the procureur it was an impossibility for the last week m de villefort has secluded himself it is natural enough this strange chain of domestic afflictions followed by the no less strange death of his daughter strange what do you mean beauchamp oh yes do you pretend that all this has been unobserved at the minister's said beauchamp placing his eyeglass in his eye where he tried to make it remain my dear sir said chateau renaud allow me to tell you that you do not understand that maneuver with the eyeglass half so well as de bray give him a lesson de bray stay said beauchamp surely i am not deceived what is it it is she whom do you mean they said she had left mademoiselle eugenie said chateau renaud has she returned no but her mother madame danglars nonsense impossible said chateau renaud only ten days after the flight of her daughter and three days from the bankruptcy of her husband de bray colored slightly and followed with his eyes the direction of beauchamp's glance come he said it is only a veiled lady some foreign princess perhaps the mother of cavalcanti but you are just speaking on a very interesting topic beauchamp i yes you were telling us about the extraordinary death of valentine ah yes so i was but how is it that madame de villefort is not here poor dear woman said de bray 
she is in no doubt occupied in distilling balm for the hospitals or in making cosmetics for herself or friends do you know she spends two or three thousand crowns a year in this amusement but i wonder she is not here i should have been pleased to see her for i like her very much and i hate her said chateau renaud why i do not know why do we love why do we hate i detest her from antipathy or rather by instinct perhaps so but to return to what you were saying beauchamp well do you know why they die so multitudinously at monsieur de villefort's multitudinously is good said chateau renaud my good fellow you'll find the word in saint simon but the thing itself is at monsieur de villefort's but let's get back to the subject talking of that said de Bray, madame was making inquiries about that house which for the last three months has been hung with black who is madame asked chateau renaud the minister's wife pardieu oh your pardon i never visit ministers i leave that to the princes really you are only before sparkling but now you are brilliant take compassion on us or like jupiter you will wither us up i will not speak again said chateau renaud pray have compassion upon me and do not take up every word i say come let us endeavour to get to the end of our story beauchamp i told you that yesterday madame made inquiries of me upon the subject enlighten me and i will then communicate my information to her well gentlemen the reason people die so multitudinously i like the word at m de villefort's is that there is an assassin in the house the two young men shuddered for the same idea had more than once occurred to them and who is the assassin they asked together young edward a burst of laughter from the auditors did not in the least disconcert the speaker who continued yes gentlemen edward the infant phenomenon who is quite an adept in the art of killing you are jesting not at all i yesterday engaged a servant who had just left monsieur de villefort i intend sending him away to-morrow for he eats so enormously to make up for the fast imposed upon him by his terror in that house well now listen we are listening it appears the dear child has obtained possession of a bottle containing some drug which he every now and then uses against those who have displeased him first monsieur and madame de saint meron incurred his displeasure so he poured out three drops of this elixir three drops were sufficient then followed barrois the old servant of monsieur noirtier who sometimes rebuffed this little wretch he therefore received the same quantity of the elixir the same happened to valentine of whom he was jealous he gave her the same dose as the others and all was over for her as well as the rest why what nonsense are you telling us said chateau renaud yes it is an extraordinary story said beauchamp is it not it is absurd said de Bray. ah said beauchamp you doubt me well you can ask my servant or rather him who will no longer be my servant to-morrow it was the talk of the house and this elixir where is it what is it the child conceals it but where did he find it in his mother's laboratory does his mother then keep poisons in her laboratory how can i tell you are questioning me like a king's attorney i only repeat what i have been told and like my informant i can do no more the poor devil would eat nothing from fear it is incredible no my dear fellow it is not at all incredible you saw the child pass through the rue richelieu last year who amused himself with killing his brothers and sisters by sticking pins in their ears while they slept the generation who follow us are very precocious come beauchamp said chateau renaud i will bet anything you do not believe a word of all you have been telling us 
"'I do not see the Count of Monte Cristo here.' "'He is worn out,' said de Bray. "'Besides, he could not well appear in public, "'since he has been the dupe of the Cavalcanti, "'who, it appears, presented themselves to him "'with false letters of credit, "'and cheated him out of one hundred thousand francs "'upon the hypothesis of this principality.' "'By the way, Monsieur de Chateaurenaud, asked Beauchamp, "'how is Morel?' "'Ma foi! I've called him three times without once seeing him. "'Still, his sister did not seem uneasy, "'and told me that though she had not seen him for two or three days, "'she was sure he was well. "'Ah, now I think of it. "'The Count of Monte Cristo cannot appear in the hall,' said Beauchamp. "'Why not?' "'Because he is an actor in the drama.' "'Has he assassinated anyone, then?' "'No, on the contrary. "'They wish to assassinate him. "'You know that it was in leaving his house "'that Monsieur de Caderousse was murdered by his friend Benedetto. "'You know that the famous waistcoat was found in his house "'containing the letter which stopped the signature of the marriage contract. "'Do you see the waistcoat? "'There it is, all blood-stained on the desk as a testimony of the crime.' "'Ah, very good.' "'Hush, gentlemen, here is the court. "'Let us go back to our places.' "'A noise was heard in the hall. "'The sergeant called his two patrons with an energetic, "'Hum!' "'And the doorkeeper, appearing, called out with that shrill voice "'peculiar to his order, ever since the days of Beaumarchais, "'The court! Gentlemen!' End of chapter 109 Chapter 110 The Indictment The judges took their places in the midst of the most profound silence. The jury took their seats. Monsieur de Villefort, the object of unusual attention, and we had almost said of general admiration, sat in the armchair and cast a tranquil glance around him. Everyone looked with astonishment on that grave and severe face whose calm expression personal griefs had been unable to disturb, and the aspect of a man who was a stranger to all human emotions excited something very like terror. "'Gendarme,' said the President, "'lead in the accused.' At these words the public attention became more intense, and all eyes were turned towards the door through which Benedetto was to enter. The door soon opened, and the accused appeared. The same impression was experienced by all present, and no one was deceived by the expression of his countenance. His features bore no sign of that deep emotion which stops the beating of the heart and blanches the cheek. His hands, gracefully placed one upon his hat, the other in the opening of his white waistcoat, were not at all tremulous. His eye was calm and even brilliant. Scarcely had he entered the hall when he glanced at the whole body of magistrates and assistants. His eye rested longer on the President, and still more so on the King's attorney. By the side of Andrea was stationed the lawyer who was to conduct his defence, and who had been appointed by the court, for Andrea disdained to pay any attention to those details, to which he appeared to attach no importance. The lawyer was a young man with light hair, whose face expressed a hundred times more emotion than that which characterized the prisoner. The President called for the indictment, revised, as we know, by the clever and implacable pen of Villefort. During the reading of this, which was long, the public attention was continually drawn towards Andrea, who bore the inspection with Spartan unconcern. Villefort had never been so concise and eloquent. The crime was depicted in the most vivid colours, the former life of the prisoner, his transformation, a review of his life from the earliest period, was set forth with all the talent that a knowledge of human life could furnish to a mind like that of the procureur. Benedetto was thus forever condemned in public opinion, before the sentence of the law could be pronounced. Andrea paid no attention to the successive charges which were brought against him. M. de Villefort, who examined him attentively, and who no doubt practised upon him all the psychological studies he was accustomed to use, in vain endeavoured to make him lower his eyes, notwithstanding the depth and profundity of his gaze. 
at length the reading of the indictment was ended accused said the president your name and surname andrea arose excuse me mr president he said in a clear voice but i see you are going to adopt a course of questions through which i cannot follow you i have an idea which i will explain by and by of making an exception to the usual form of accusation allow me then if you please to answer in different order or i will not do so at all the astonished president looked at the jury who in turn looked at villefort the whole assembly manifested great surprise but andrea appeared quite unmoved your age said the president you will answer that question i will answer that question as well as the rest mr president but in its turn your age repeated the president i am twenty-one years old or rather i shall be in a few days as i was born the night of the twenty-seventh of september eighteen seventeen Monsieur de Villefort, who was busy taking down some notes, raised his head at the mention of this date. "'Where were you born?' continued the President. "'At Auteuil, near Paris.' Monsieur de Villefort, a second time, raised his head, looked at Benedetto as if he had been gazing at the head of Medusa, and became livid. As for Benedetto, he gracefully wiped his lips with a fine cambric pocket-handkerchief your profession first i was a forger answered andrea as calmly as possible then i became a thief and lately have become an assassin a murmur or rather storm of indignation burst from all parts of the assembly the judges themselves appeared to be stupefied and the jury manifested tokens of disgust for cynicism so unexpected in a man of fashion monsieur de villefort pressed his hand upon his brow which at first pale had become red and burning then he suddenly arose and looked around as though he had lost his senses he wanted air are you looking for anything monsieur procureur asked benedetto with his most ingratiating smile monsieur de villefort answered nothing but sat or rather threw himself down again upon his chair and now prisoner you will consent to tell your name said the president the brutal affectation with which you have enumerated and classified your crimes calls for a severe reprimand on the part of the court both in the name of morality and for the respect due to humanity you appear to consider this a point of honor and it may be for this reason that you have delayed acknowledging your name you wished it to be preceded by all these titles it is quite wonderful mr president how entirely you have read my thoughts said benedetto in his softest voice and most polite manner this is indeed the reason why i begged you to alter the order of the questions the public astonishment had reached its height there was no longer any deceit or bravado in the manner of the accused the audience felt that a startling revelation was to follow this ominous prelude well said the president your name i cannot tell you my name since i do not know it but i know my father's and can tell it to you a painful giddiness overwhelmed villefort great drops of acrid sweat fell from his face upon the papers which he held in his convulsed hand repeat your father's name said the president not a whisper not a breath was heard in that vast assembly everyone waited anxiously my father is king's attorney replied andrea calmly king's attorney said the president stupefied and without noticing the agitation which spread over the face of monsieur de villefort king's attorney yes and if you wish to know his name i will tell you it he is named villefort the explosion which had been so long restrained from a feeling of respect to the court of justice now burst forth like thunder from the breasts of all present 
the court itself did not seek to restrain the feelings of the audience the exclamations the insults addressed to benedetto who remained perfectly unconcerned the energetic gestures the movement of the gendarme the sneers of the scum of the crowd always sure to rise to the surface in case of any disturbance all this lasted five minutes before the doorkeepers and magistrates were able to restore silence in the midst of this tumult the voice of the president was heard to exclaim are you playing with justice accused and do you dare set your fellow citizens an example of disorder which even these times has never been equalled several persons hurried up to monsieur de villefort who sat half bowed over in his chair offering him consolation encouragement and protestations of zeal and sympathy order was re-established in the hall except that a few people still moved about and whispered to one another a lady it was said had just fainted they had supplied her with a smelling bottle and she had recovered during the scene of tumult andrea had turned his smiling face towards the assembly then leaning with one hand on the oaken rail of the dock in the most graceful attitude possible he said gentlemen i assure you i had no idea of insulting the court or of making a useless disturbance in the presence of this honourable assembly they ask my age i tell it they ask where i was born i answer they ask my name i cannot give it since my parents abandoned me but though i cannot give my own name not possessing one i can tell them my father's now i repeat my father is named monsieur de villefort and i am ready to prove it there was an energy a conviction and a sincerity in the manner of the young man which silenced the tumult all eyes were turned for a moment towards the procureur who sat as motionless as though a thunderbolt had changed him into a corpse gentlemen said andrea commanding silence by his voice and manner i owe you the proofs and explanations of what i have said but said the irritated president you called yourself benedetto declared yourself an orphan and claimed corsica as your country i said anything i pleased in order that the solemn declaration i have just made should not be withheld which otherwise would certainly have been the case i now repeat that i was born at auteuil on the night of the twenty seventh of september eighteen seventeen and that i am the son of the procureur monsieur de villefort do you wish for any further details i will give them i was born in number twenty eight rue de la fontaine in a room hung with red damask my father took me in his arms telling my mother i was dead wrapped me in a napkin marked with an h and an n and carried me into a garden where he buried me alive a shudder ran through the assembly when they saw that the confidence of the prisoner increased in proportion to the terror of monsieur de villefort but how have you become acquainted with all these details asked the president i will tell you mr president a man who had sworn vengeance against my father and had long watched his opportunity to kill him had introduced himself that night into the garden in which my father buried me he was concealed in a thicket he saw my father bury something in the ground and stabbed him then thinking the deposit might contain some treasure he turned up the ground and found me still living the man carried me to the foundling asylum where i was registered under the number thirty seven three months afterwards a woman travelling from rogliano to paris to fetch me and having claimed me as her son carried me away thus you see though born in paris i was brought up in corsica there was a moment's silence during which one could have fancied the hall empty so profound was the stillness proceed said the president certainly i might have lived happily amongst those good people who adored me but my perverse disposition prevailed over the virtues which my adopted mother endeavoured to instil into my heart i increased in wickedness till i committed crime 
one day when i cursed providence for making me so wicked and ordaining me to such a fate my adopted father said to me do not blaspheme unhappy child the crime is that of your father not yours of your father who consigned you to hell if you died and to misery if a miracle preserved you alive after that i ceased to blaspheme but i cursed my father that is why i have uttered the words for which you blame me that is why i have filled this whole assembly with horror i have committed an additional crime punish me but if you will allow that ever since the day of my birth my fate has been sad bitter and lamentable then pity me but your mother asked the president my mother thought me dead she is not guilty i did not even wish to know her name nor do i know it just then a piercing cry ending in a sob burst from the centre of the crowd who encircled the lady who had before fainted and who now fell into a violent fit of hysterics she was carried out of the hall the thick veil which concealed her face dropped off and madame d'anglars was recognized notwithstanding his shattered nerves the ringing sensation in his ears and the madness which turned his brain villefort rose as he perceived her the proofs the proofs said the president remember this tissue of horrors must be supported by the clearest proofs the proofs said benedetto laughing <laughs> do you want the proofs yes well then look at monsieur de villefort and then ask me for proofs everyone turned towards the procureur who unable to bear the universal gaze now riveted on him alone advanced staggering into the midst of the tribunal with his hair dishevelled and his face indented with the mark of his nails the whole assembly uttered a long murmur of astonishment father said benedetto i am asked for proofs do you wish me to give them no no it it is useless stammered m de villefort in a hoarse voice no it is useless how useless cried the president what do you mean i mean that i feel it impossible to struggle against this deadly weight which crushes me gentlemen i know i am in the hands of an avenging god we need no proofs everything relating to this young man is true a dull gloomy silence like that which precedes some awful phenomenon of nature pervaded the assembly who shuddered in dismay what monsieur de villefort cried the president do you yield to an hallucination what are you no longer in possession of your senses this strange unexpected terrible accusation has disordered your reason come recover the procureur dropped his head his teeth chattered like those of a man under a violent attack of fever and yet he was deadly pale i am in possession of all my senses sir he said my body alone suffers as you may suppose i acknowledge myself guilty of all the young man has brought against me and from this hour hold myself under the authority of the procureur who will succeed me and as he spoke these words with a hoarse choking voice he staggered towards the door which was mechanically opened by a doorkeeper the whole assembly were dumb with astonishment at the revelation and confession which had produced a catastrophe so different from that which had been expected during the last fortnight by the parisian world well said beauchamp let them now say that drama is unnatural ma foi said chateau renaud i would rather end my career like monsieur de morcerf a pistol shot seems quite delightful compared with this catastrophe and moreover it kills said beauchamp and to think i had an idea of marrying his daughter said debray she did well to die poor girl the sitting is adjourned gentlemen 
said the president fresh inquiries will be made and the case will be tried next session by another magistrate as for andrea who was calm and more interesting than ever he left the hall escorted by gendarme who involuntarily paid him some attention well what do you think of this my fine fellow asked de bray of the sergeant-at-arms slipping a louis into his hand there will be extenuating circumstance he replied end of chapter 110 chapter 111 expiation notwithstanding the density of the crowd monsieur de villefort saw it open before him there is something so awe-inspiring in great afflictions that even in the worst times the first emotion of a crowd has generally been to sympathize with the sufferer in a great catastrophe many people have been assassinated in a tumult but even criminals have rarely been insulted during trial thus villefort passed through the mass of spectators and officers of the palais and withdrew though he had acknowledged his guilt he was protected by his grief there are some situations which men understand by instinct but which reason is powerless to explain in such cases the greatest poet is he who gives utterance to the most natural and vehement outburst of sorrow those who hear the bitter cry are as much impressed as if they listened to an entire poem and when the sufferer is sincere they are right in regarding his outburst as sublime it would be difficult to describe the state of stupor in which villefort left the palais every pulse beat with feverish excitement every nerve was strained every vein swollen and every part of his body seemed to suffer distinctly from the rest thus multiplying his agony a thousandfold he made his way along the corridors through force of habit he threw aside his magisterial robe not out of deference to etiquette but because it was an unbearable burden a veritable garb of nessus insatiate in torture having staggered as far as the rue dauphine he perceived his carriage awoke his sleeping coachman by opening the door himself threw himself on the cushions and pointed towards the faubourg saint honore the garage drove on the weight of his fallen fortune seemed suddenly to crush him he could not foresee the consequences he could not contemplate the future with the indifference of the hardened criminal who merely faces a contingency already familiar god was still in his heart god he murmured not knowing what he said god god behind the event that had overwhelmed him he saw the hand of god the carriage rolled rapidly onward villefort while turning restlessly on the cushions felt something press against him he put out his hand to remove the object it was a fan which madame de villefort had left in the carriage this fan awakened a recollection which darted through his mind like lightning he thought of his wife oh he exclaimed as though a red-hot iron were piercing his heart during the last hour his own crime had alone been presented to his mind now another object not less terrible suddenly presented itself his wife he had just acted the inexorable judge with her he had condemned her to death and she crushed by remorse struck with terror covered with the shame inspired by the eloquence of his irreproachable virtue she a poor weak woman without help or the power of defending herself against his absolute and supreme will she might at that very moment perhaps be preparing to die an hour had elapsed since her condemnation at that moment doubtless she was recalling all her crimes to her memory she was asking pardon for her sins perhaps she was even writing a letter imploring forgiveness from her virtuous husband a forgiveness she was purchasing with her death villefort again groaned with anguish and despair ah oh, he exclaimed that woman became criminal only from associating with me i carried the infection of crime with me and she has caught it as she would the typhus fever the cholera the plague and yet i have punished her i have dared to tell her i have repent and die but no 
she must not die she shall live and with me we will flee from paris and go as far as the earth reaches i told her of the scaffold oh heavens i forgot that it awaits me also how could i pronounce that word yes we will fly i will confess all to her i will tell her daily that i also have committed a crime oh what an alliance the tiger and the serpent worthy wife of such as i am she must live that my infamy may diminish hers and villefort dashed upon the window in front of the carriage faster faster he cried in a tone which electrified the coachman the horses impelled by fear flew towards the house yes yes repeated villefort as he approached the home yes that the woman must live she must repent and educate my son the sole survivor with the exception of the indestructible old man of the wreck of my house she loves him it was for his sake she has committed these crimes we ought never to despair of softening the heart of a mother who loves her child she will repent and no one will know that she has been guilty the events which have taken place in my house though they now occupy the public mind will be forgotten in time or if indeed a few enemies should persist in remembering them why then i will add them to my list of crimes what will it signify if one two or three more are added my wife and child shall escape from this gulf carrying treasures with them she will live and may yet be happy since her child in whom all her love is centred will be with her i shall have performed a good action and my heart will be lighter and the procureur breathed more freely than he had done for some time the carriage stopped at the door of the house villefort leapt out of the carriage and saw that his servants were surprised at his early return he could read no other expression in their features neither of them spoke to him they merely stood aside to let him pass by as usual nothing more as he passed by m noirtier's room he perceived two figures through the half-open door but he experienced no curiosity to know who was visiting his father anxiety carried him on further come he said as he ascended the stairs leading to his wife's room nothing is changed here he then closed the door of the landing no one must disturb us he said i must speak freely to her accuse myself and say he approached the door touched the crystal handle which yielded to his hand not locked he cried that is well and he entered the little room in which edward slept for though the child went to school during the day his mother could not allow him to be separated from her at night with a single glance villefort's eye ran through the room not here he said doubtless she is in her bedroom he rushed towards the door found it bolted and stopped shuddering eloise he cried he fancied he heard the sound of a piece of furniture being removed eloise he repeated who is there answered the voice of her he sought he thought that voice more feeble than usual open the door cried villefort open it is i but notwithstanding this request notwithstanding the tone of anguish in which it was uttered the door remained closed villefort burst it open with a violent blow at the entrance of the room which led her to her boudoir madame de villefort was standing erect pale her features contracted and her eyes glaring horribly eloise eloise he said what is the matter speak the young woman extended her stiff white hands towards him it is done monsieur she said with a rattling noise which seemed to tear her throat what more do you want and she fell full length on the floor villefort ran to her and seized her hand which convulsively clasped a crystal bottle with a golden stopper madame de villefort was dead villefort maddened with horror stepped back to the threshold of the door fixing his eyes on the corpse my son he exclaimed suddenly where is my son edward edward and he rushed out of the room still crying edward edward 
the name was pronounced in such a tone of anguish that the servants ran up where is my son asked villefort let him be removed from the house that he may not see master edward is not downstairs sir replied the valet then he must be playing in the garden go and see no sir madame de villefort sent for him half an hour ago he went into her room and has not been downstairs since a cold perspiration burst out on villefort's brow his legs trembled and his thoughts flew about madly in his brain like the wheels of a disordered watch in madame de villefort's room he murmured and slowly returned with one hand wiping his forehead and with the other supporting himself against the wall to enter the room he must again see the body of his unfortunate wife to call edward he must reawaken the echo of that room which now appeared like a sepulchre to speak seemed like violating the silence of the tomb his tongue was paralyzed in his mouth Ed edward he stammered Ed edward the child did not answer where then could he be if he had entered his mother's room and not since returned he stepped forward the corpse of madame de villefort was stretched across the doorway leading to the room in which edward must be those glaring eyes seemed to watch over the threshold and the lips bore the stamp of a terrible and mysterious irony through the open door was visible a portion of the boudoir containing an upright piano and a blue satin couch villefort stepped forward two or three paces and beheld his child lying no doubt asleep on the sofa the unhappy man uttered an exclamation of joy a ray of light seemed to penetrate the abyss of despair and darkness he had only to step over the corpse enter the boudoir take the child in his arms and flee far far away villefort was no longer the civilized man he was a tiger hurt unto death gnashing his teeth in his wound he no longer feared realities but phantoms he leapt over the corpse as if it had been burning brazier he took the child in his arms embraced him shook him called him but the child made no response he pressed his burning lips to the cheeks but they were icy cold and pale he felt the stiffened limbs he pressed his hand upon the heart but it no longer beat the child was dead a folded paper fell from edward's breast villefort thunderstruck fell upon his knees the child dropped from his arms and rolled on the floor by the side of its mother he picked up the paper and recognizing his wife's writing ran his eyes rapidly over its contents it ran as follows you know that i was a good mother since it was for my son's sake i became a criminal a good mother cannot depart without her son villefort could not believe his eyes he could not believe his reason he dragged himself towards the child's body and examined it as a lioness contemplates its dead cub then a piercing cry escaped from his breast and he cried still the hand of god the presence of the two victims alarmed him he couldn't bear solitude shared only by two corpses until then he had been sustained by rage by his strength of mind by despair by the supreme agony which led the titans to scale the heavens and ajax to defy the gods he now arose his head bowed beneath the weight of grief and shaking his damp disheveled hair he who had never felt compassion for any one determined to seek his father that he might have some one to whom he could relate his misfortunes some one by whose side he might weep he descended the little staircase with which we are acquainted and entered noirtier's room the old man appeared to be listening attentively and as affectionately as his infirmities would allow to the abbe Boussoni, who looked cold and calm as usual villefort perceiving the abbe passed his hand across his brow 
he recollected the call he had made upon him after the dinner at Auteuil, and then the visit the abbe had himself paid to his house on the day of Valentine's death. "'You here, sir!' he exclaimed. "'Do you, then, never appear but to act as an escort to death?' Busoni turned around, and perceiving the excitement depicted on the magistrate's face, the savage luster of his eyes, he understood that the revelation had been made at the assizes. But beyond this he was ignorant. "'I came to pray over the body of your daughter.' "'And now, why are you here?' "'I come to tell you that you have sufficiently repaid your debt, and that from this moment I will pray to God to forgive you, as I do. "'Good heavens!' exclaimed Villefort, stepping back fearfully. "'Surely that is not the voice of the Abbe Boussoni!' "'No,' the Abbe threw off his wig, shook his head, and his hair, no longer confined, fell in black masses around his manly face. "'It is the face of the Count of Monte Cristo!' exclaimed the procureur, with a haggard expression. "'You are not exactly right, Monsieur Procureur. You must go farther back.' "'That voice! That voice! Where did I first hear it?' "'You heard it for the first time at Marseilles, twenty-three years ago, the day of your marriage with Mademoiselle de saint Méran. Refer to your papers.' "'You are not Boussoni? You are not Monte Cristo?' Oh heavens you are then some secret implacable and mortal enemy i must have wronged you in some way at marseilles oh woe to me yes you are now on the right path said the count crossing his arms over his broad chest search search but what have i done to you exclaimed villefort whose mind was balancing between reason and insanity in that cloud which is neither a dream nor reality. "'What have I done to you? Tell me, then, speak!' "'You condemned me to a horrible, tedious death. You killed my father. You deprived me of liberty, of love and happiness.' "'Who are you, then? Who are you?' "'I am the spectre of a wretch you buried in the dungeons of the Chateau d'If. God gave that spectre the form of the Count of Monte Cristo, when he at length issued from his tomb, enriched him with gold and diamonds, and led him to you. "'Ah! I recognize you! I recognize you!' exclaimed the king's attorney. "'You are!' "'I am Edmond Dante.' "'You are Edmond Dante?' cried Villefort seizing the count by the wrist then come here and up the stairs he dragged monte cristo who ignorant of what had happened followed him in astonishment foreseeing some new catastrophe there edmond dante he said pointing to the bodies of his wife and child see si, are you well avenged monte cristo became pale at this horrible sight he felt that he had passed beyond the bounds of vengeance, and that he could no longer say, "'God is for and with me.' With an expression of indescribable anguish he threw himself upon the body of the child, reopened its eyes, felt its pulse, and then rushed with him into Valentine's room, of which he double-locked the door. "'My child!' cried Villefort. "'He carries away the body of my child! Oh, curses! Woe! Death to you!' and he tried to follow Monte Cristo, but as though in a dream he was transfixed to the spot. His eyes glared as though they were starting through the sockets. He gripped the flesh on his chest until his nails were stained with blood. The veins of his temples swelled and boiled as though they would burst their narrow boundary and deluge his brain with living fire. This lasted several minutes, until the frightful overturn of reason was accomplished. Then uttering a loud cry, followed by a burst of laughter, he rushed down the stairs. A quarter of an hour afterwards, the door of Valentine's room opened, and Monte Cristo reappeared. Pale, with a dull eye and heavy heart, 
all the noble features of that face usually so calm and serene were overcast by grief in his arms he held the child whom no skill had been able to recall to life bending on one knee he placed it reverently by the side of its mother with its head upon her breast then rising he went out and meeting a servant on the stairs he asked where is monsieur de villefort the servant instead of answering pointed to the garden monte cristo ran down the steps and advancing towards the spot designated beheld villefort encircled by his servants with a spade in his hand and digging the earth with fury it is not here he cried it is not here and then he moved farther on and began again to dig monte cristo approached him and said in a low voice with an expression almost humble sir you have indeed lost a son but villefort interrupted him he had neither listened nor heard oh i will find it he cried you may pretend he is not here but i will find him though i dig forever monte cristo drew back in horror oh he said he is mad and as though he feared that the walls of the accursed house would crumble around him he rushed into the street for the first time doubting whether he had the right to do as he had done oh enough of this enough of this he cried let me save the last on entering his house he met morel who wandered about like a ghost awaiting the heavenly mandate for return to the tomb prepare yourself maximilian he said with a smile we leave paris to-morrow have you nothing more to do there asked morel no replied monte cristo god grant i may not have done too much already the next day they indeed left accompanied only by baptistin haiti had taken away ali and bertuccio remained with noirtier end of chapter 111 and now you say why i said it was good that we had a moment to remember the count doubting a little bit of what he had wrought last week when he was unsure of whether he could do anything more for mercedes and albert because this was coming i found it fascinating that his vengeance had a limit and having already seen him thrown a bit last week to see him really unnerved by what happened with edward i couldn't tell how upset or if upset at all uh he, he was about madame viafor i i think kind of not upset she needed to go before she killed again but edward although obnoxious was an innocent and edmund had been an innocent i also thought how amazingly cinematic that moment was where the count reveals himself to viafor and it's this big moment that we've been waiting for and that the count has been waiting for and he he makes his grand appearance and viafor has a hard time placing him not surprisingly and then when it all falls into place and the the pieces start clicking when viafor grabbed his arm and ran with him that image of the count being completely discombobulated by this it, why is he doing this where are we going i i the count of monte cristo am surprised this is such an odd feeling where did, where did this come from and of course we know where he's getting taken to it's a beautiful piece of writing dramatically speaking on alexandre dumas part but i thought just the grand total of these four chapters had some extraordinary writing in it as well because he he took us from those scenes in the beginning between Viefort the looks between Viefort and Watier and the scene between Viefort and his wife and the the righteous outrage that he has and then the assizes and all the fun and the big reveal from Cavalcante from Benedetto and and it's just extraordinary how much got packed into these four chapters 
And then the whole carriage ride home with Fiafor talking to himself and already slowly unhinging himself as he goes. And then the, the whole scene with his wife. And we, correct me if I'm wrong, but we knew Edward wasn't just taking a nap when he got home, right? You knew that. You saw it coming. And then, oh, oh. And then for the Count to go and, and lock himself in the room and try to revive little Edward. And as obnoxious as that kid was, it's impossible not to have your heart broken. And now, now what does the Count do? I mean, he's, he's gotten Caderousse. He's gotten Fernand. Mm-hmm. He's, he's sure done got Viafor now. Denglar ran away. Denglar's wife is a ruin, a beautiful ruin. And we just finished chapter 111. There's only 117 chapters in the book. So we've got six more chapters. I don't know what's going to happen. I guess you're going to have to tune in next week and find out. Because the thing that I think is kind of stunning in the the storytelling part of, of where we're at is right now we should feel not necessarily relieved, but sated. It's like, ah, he finally got all the bad guys. And I don't know about you, but I'm not feeling that way. And it's interesting because we're having a parallel thing happening in The Wizard of Oz. In The Wizard of Oz, the book, the death of the Wicked Witch is midway through the book. And Baum did that for some very, very specific reasons, which we're going to talk about this week's episode, episode 12 of The Wizard of Oz. The movie is is fairly classic. You know, the the killing of the Wicked Witch, the tossing the water on her, all of that. That's the climax. It isn't really in the book. And here it's hard not to feel like, wow, six chapters, six chapters for Dumas, just like six chapters for Dickens is not nothing. A lot can happen. A lot of real estate can be taken up in those six chapters. You can have quite a few pages. So we're going to have to, uh, we're just going to have to stick around and see what, what comes next from old Alexandre. <laughs> and over on Brave New Podcast, uh, Justin and I are about to get into the big reveal of what Orwell has been up to in creating this society, because he, he makes it fairly transparent midway through the book, what's going on in his mind. And you can see why he felt the need to write this. And speaking of thing one, discovered a YouTube channel called Overly Sarcastic Productions. And I will be linking out to a couple of Overly Sarcastic Productions. But just for fun, if you loved or hated, (laughs) whether you loved or hated Lord of the Flies, I think that's the one you should start with on this particular YouTube channel. She does all of the Greek myths. She has a a history major. They're both at Yale, I think. Uh, A history major who's also doing a bunch of Greek and Roman history. They've just, they do it all. And they're very, well, very sarcastic. So there's a lot of fun to be had over there. And on that note, a slightly happier note, I will leave you. Take care. Have a great week. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. A big thanks to all the Craftlet listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.